Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. This is part two of the April, but actually kind of a little bit in May Q&A. So as always, if you missed part one, go back and check out that video that was published probably yesterday if the schedule is all nice and running. Um, yeah, more questions to get to. So yeah, let's, let's get, get into it. them. Okay, next one from Michael. Appears most reviewers feel the NVIDIA GTX 2060 is a better buy than the NVIDIA GTX 2070. Currently playing at 1080p, or currently playing on a 1080p monitor, but would it be worth the extra cost to purchase a 2070 to future-proof uh, my system, or is it a waste of money? Thank you. You got any thoughts on that one? Um... Well, those two GPUs are pretty close together in terms of their performance, aren't they? So... Relative. It's the 2 gigabyte extra VRAM buffer that he's talking about for future-proofing. Ah, oh, right. Yeah, I don't think that was explicitly mentioned. It wasn't, but question, that's... But... Well, that's my assumption. So Yeah, well, that'd have to be it, right? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the cost is... The, the 2060 is just a lot better value right now. I think if you're thinking about fu the future when that sort of difference would make you know a big deal, mm -hmm. you're probably looking at so far in the future that you probably will need to be thinking of an upgrade anyway so i always like to think in the present with these things and think you know definitely even if there there is an opportunity to future proof and it's always good to get hardware that's at least going to last you a little bit i always like to just make sure that what i'm buying is the best option now mm -hmm. because i think over the years those options still tend to be the best for the future even if you if you spend a lot more to get a little bit extra it doesn't tend to, you know, give you a lot more down the line. So, yeah. and you have to evaluate at the time. So you're, you're talking about 150 US, which is a significant cost increase for two gig extra VRAM uh, and a small bump in performance. I mean, it can vary a bit depending on the game, but it's generally pretty small overall. Uh, and for me, it's not worth $150, and I'm not too concerned about the VRAM because uh, for the next few years, it's not going to be a big deal. You know, six gigabytes will get you by. And yep. if you can't install the HD texture pack or whatever, or you have to tweak a few settings, so be it. I mean, it's up to you whether you want to, you know, if you want to spend $150 to ensure that you can use HD textures and you don't have to tweak settings, then that's really what it comes down to. Yeah. Uh, but I, I don't think it's worth future-proofing for that, especially at 1080p. <laughs> I would just be getting the, the RTX 2060 personally. Um, and that's, that's pretty much that for me. Yep. Rupert, do you do this for a living? I really hope so. Greetings from Germany. I miss the Oz sometimes. Uh, well, greetings from Australia to Germany. Uh, but yeah, okay, so yes, we do do this full time. Uh, we both still work for TechSpot. Uh, but yeah, that's... Well, Tim was a uni student and doing TechSpot. I was doing TechSpot pretty well full time. I had a few things on the side that I was doing as well. But now the channel is our main focus but we still yeah create content for TechSpot as well because we we love the guys over at TechSpot and they've uh, supported us for a long time so we'll continue to to support the site and yeah we enjoy working with them but yeah this is our full-time job now so yep. we're doing our best to make it work okay i see there's a big long question about hdr here so i'll i'll do my best to try to read this out and maybe yeah and try and answer it as, summarize as well as it okay that's a bit of a novel question for tim so i think the start part here is basically saying you know this person has seen my checklist for what's required for good HDR and has done a lot of research and figured out that a lot of things that advertise as HDR actually don't meet HDR 400 specs. You know, they fail, fail a whole bunch of stuff. Um, my question to you is, if I can get a monitor that has HDR 400 specs, can I at least experience the poor man's version of HDR? Because I admit I'm poor and I can't afford a proper HDR monitor, but I would like to at least see the poor man's version of it. I get that it will not be... You not see HDR as true glory, but at least some of it. Is that possible? Or with HDR, uh, you go big or you go home. And it says mention purchasing the, the 27 UK 650 from LG. Um, okay. So just to interrupt for a second, that's a great question. Because I obviously watch all of Tim's monitor reviews. And yeah. I've kind of wondered that myself. Yeah, so about the, the poor man's Yeah, HDR. I've okay. kind of wondered that. So, so I'm interested to see what you say. Okay, How, can I make this a short answer? That's my main thing. Okay, so... The, the thing with HDR 400 and not meeting the requirements is that it gets to a point where you can almost get the experience that turning the HDR on switch would give you from just a non-HDR monitor and tweaking some of the settings. And the thing that I've found and what I've tried to test myself is an HDR 400 monitor versus an SDR monitor at its peak brightness. 
because often you press the HDR switch and on an HDR 400 monitor, they can only just increase its brightness. It doesn't have a wide color gamut. It doesn't have dimming. So what can it do? It can make things brighter. Mm -hmm. And I've found that when you use those two monitors side by side, they look pretty much the same. And that's what frustrates me the most about these specs is that people might think they're getting HDR because it does look different from what you would normally use your monitor in. You don't normally run it at full brightness. Mm -hmm. So it does look different. You turn on, oh, wow, that looks a bit different. But is it any different from a non-HDR monitor? Mm -hmm. And that tends to be no. You okay. could just switch that all the way up to all the way up to the peak brightness. Mm. Where I sort of think you will find sort of your, your poor man's HDR is with the HDR 600 tier monitors, which I've sort of been calling semi-HDR, some dude screams past in his truck. Um, yeah, the, the semi-HDR stuff is really where you start to see a little bit of a difference, but it won't be super good. Okay. So I think with the HDR 400, you pretty much just have to completely ignore those monitors. As they, they will look very similar to non-HDR, the non-HDR mode. So that's so, why you're so frustrated with it, basically. Yeah, because I think it's not HDR. And, and as you say, you can find all these these monitors that don't meet all those specs. And, you know, I don't think that I'm a, you know, a god of HDR or I, I haven't, you know, just made up these specs for, from nowhere. It's, it's from speaking to people in the industry and especially how content is mastered. You know, what a movie studio is doing when they make HDR and then what do you need to show that? And all those things on that list you need so that you can actually see what the content creators mm -hmm. are doing. Yep. So, yeah, from, from my perspective, it really is you have to go big or go home. Okay. Well, that makes sense. I mean, you did a really good video on what you need for HDR and yeah. explain it all. I think um, it, it's like it's a high-end feature. It's what you add on top of what you've already got with the monitor. Mm -hmm. It's 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 not really like you can have a mid-range product with mid-range HDR. It's kind of you have to get the the basics right, have a good quality monitor, then you add HDR on top. It's kind of like ray tracing on top of ultra graphics. Yep. Like we've never... We were sort of discussing this in the past. Would you run ray tracing with your with medium quality? Graphics? It doesn't make it doesn't, sense to me. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And no. I think that's similar to, to what we're seeing in HDR now. You really have to go all out. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like I said, I think all this stuff will sort itself out over time. Yep. We'll get we'll get proper HDR eventually. And there are some things that can be done so that you sort of get that semi HDR experience for lower tier products, entry level, mid range. You know, the HDR six hundred tier products are that, but. Yeah, I just hope that over time this will get better, and especially when the tech gets cheaper, it should be better for everyone. Mm -hmm. I've always heard AIOs have a lifespan of five to six years. In your experience, is that fairly accurate? I hope we don't get demonetized because they think we're using the sounds of nature in the <laughs> oh, background. Maybe. Uh, yeah, this is a this is an interesting one because I've used uh, all-in-one liquid coolers from quite a few different companies now, and I would say that a five to six year lifespan good like yep. i've probably got a couple that have lasted that long i've got quite a lot of test systems using them and i do use them on a regular basis uh, but they're not run 24 7 but even the ones that i've had some that are run 24 7 like my enemax uh, gamers nexus just looked at the tr4 version of yeah. the, the lick tech mine died uh i think it may have gunked up i think the pump's still okay i was going to take that apart i might do a video on that soon if i get time see what the deal with that is uh, because mine will be in worse condition than the ones from Gamers Nexus. I think I've got the gunking problem, like I said. But I would say, on average, gee, maybe two to three. Yeah, like, I think that's what, what I've heard a lot of. Is yeah. So two to three is good. Two to three would be my experience, and that's with like taking a lot, like a lot of brands into consideration. Um, yeah, if you're getting five to six, that's definitely a quality model. Um, I have no doubt there's ones that will do that. But yeah, a lot of mine from heavy use have died sort of, yeah, three years. Four would probably be the upper end that I've had an, an all-in-one liquid cooler survive. So yeah, five to six would be good. I would say that's probably not the norm. But hey, if you guys have some experience in the comments, let us know. Maybe we should do a poll on this and see. It'd be interesting. Yeah. I They're definitely... All-in-one liquid coolers are an interesting beast because I much prefer them over a big air cooler. Big air cooler is more practical in the sense that the only thing, it, you know, it has a fan on it and that's it. And the fan's easy to replace generally. But I like the practicality of the all-in-one liquid cooler because it's compact and it lets you work around the CPU socket, like changing memory and stuff's really easy. And that's why I imagine a lot of YouTubers such as us and other 
uh, tech reviewers do prefer the uh, all-in-one liquid coolers because it's just really easy for swapping memory in and out and messing around the system and that stuff we do on a regular basis. And I also like the look of them and I think that's why most of you guys get them as well. And they are really good at cooling. So they sort of rival the top tier air coolers, but they cost more. So they're not great in terms yeah. of price versus performance. Anyway, I'm probably getting a bit sidetracked on that one. So yeah, we'll move on to the next question because I think I addressed that. Uh, okay. When benchmarking, do you constantly retest cards for every video or do you go use results gathered from previous videos uh, to save time when no driver updates have occurred between videos, of course? Uh, well, this one, yeah, we do a bit of both. So occasionally I'll just do a, a head to head or some big benchmark video. I'll delete all my results, completely ignore them and retest everything and work out where things are at with the latest game versions, latest drivers and all that sort of stuff. Because, And you have to do that fairly regularly because games do get updated, drivers do get updated, and often one of them or maybe both of them do bring about performance changes. Sometimes we change, off, quite often I change where I test as well over time. You know, we find somewhere better or somewhere more consistent or whatever. Uh, but basically I say in my videos, I'm like, all this data is fresh and I've done that many times. All this data is fresh, so everything's been tested in the last few days or the last week or whenever, however long it took to make the video. Uh, and then sometimes I'll work off that data for a month or so, or, and some games will get updated. Uh, so if there's a driver update that targets a game, I'll retest that. And I do do a lot of retesting, but I won't necessarily change the results because it's margin of error. And when people see numbers changing around by one or two FPS, they get a bit triggered. They think things are yep. being dodgily changed. Uh, but uh, normally I note where those changes are and when they've occurred. Uh, but yeah, a bit of both really. But we try to keep everything up to date as often as possible. But obviously when you're testing 30 games at multiple resolutions and many graphics cards, it's difficult to keep on top of it all the time. But we do our best. Okay, next question. Can we have a Steve off between Hub Steve and GN Steve? <laughs> Might give Marvel a run for the most ambitious crossover. Uh, they can even fight off the mighty Tim, what's the Tim OS? Tim Timos, Timos? Like Thanos, Timos, right? Of course, yeah, silly me. Uh, the Monitor King. <laughs> well, you're right. kind of unchallenged on, on YouTube for being the Monitor oh, I King. I think there's so a few people. But does yeah. anyone do proper, you know, input a testing? Few, I think and... artings are the, or ratings, whatever they say, okay, they, they do a good okay, job as okay, well. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I don't know what a Steve off is, but yeah, it'd be fantastic to do some crossover content with those guys. But the chances of it happening are extremely remote because we really only sort of run into each other at trade shows like Computex and they're going a million miles per hour trying to get all their obligations done. We're doing the same. So it's kind of like a, hey, how you going? Shake each other's hand and move on. But yeah, it'd be, it'd be pretty awesome to do something with one of those guys one day. You can only dream. Maybe it'll happen. Uh, we might go spend some time in the US and... Who yeah. knows? So, but yeah, now really like really like the guys from uh, Gamers Nexus, and yeah, I chat to Steve every now and then when we get stuck with things or they do, and we try to help each other out. Okay, why is the Ryzen Seven CPU a bottleneck for the RTX 2080 Ti when CPU usage never gets to 100% on all threads in almost any game, even if the game spreads the load evenly, like Forza Horizon Four? Uh, okay, this is sort of like a question we touched on earlier. Don't actually remember the question, and I don't know what part are in now. But anyway, uh, reason is sort of clock speed, but I know that comes under utilization. It's mostly latency, I would say, and then just how well the game's optimized for the Ryzen architecture, uh, and also CPU utilization can be really, really misleading. Um, sometimes, yeah, sometimes high utilization is good, sometimes it's not, um, and. Yeah, it, it, I think when when the game is using all cores threads really well, it's spreading the load evenly, uh, but the Intel CPU is still faster, uh, that would probably be more latency and then just instructions. Maybe the game is using AVX or things of that nature. So I think that's probably the reason why. Uh, and Ryzen really hasn't been around that long yet. So there's really no game engines that have been designed from the ground up with Ryzen in mind. Uh, and that's certainly the case for Intel. So, yeah. Anything to add to that? Yep, sounds good. Okay, I think we have to address this question purely based on the username. Um, yeah, I've crushed on Tim. Is that what the kids say these days? <laughs> anyway, this is someone who's clearly a Tim fan. Uh, 
Can you clear the AMD motherboard support promise? Uh, clear that up, I'm assuming. If I buy an X470 now, is it going to support Ryzen 4000 or 5000 or AMD will change the socket after the 3000 series? So this is really, can you clear up the whole AMD, AM4 compatibility thing? I know that came up with Zen 2 MSI. There was some story that we didn't pay too much attention to because it seemed like a load of rubbish to me. Um, was that that you covered? Do you touch on that news corner? It was an MSI representative said. That yeah, they but they, they then corrected themselves and basically said that, that was they're continuing to support. Those. That was clearly never a real situation, but a lot of guys picked up and ran with it. Uh, but AMD has themselves promised till 2020 AM4 compatibility with all new CPU architectures. So Zen 2 will work on your X470 board, uh, whether it's MSI or any other brand, there will be a BIOS update and it will work. As for the 4000, 5000 series, hard to say there. I imagine we will have AM4 compatibility with all future architectures that use DDR4 memory. AMD will probably only change the socket to something else, AM5 or whatever, when we get DDR5. So Yeah, that'll make sense, I think. It would, yep. So that'll break compatibility. Okay, next one, Rusted Hammer. Do you think a 16-core AM4 CPU on a dual-channel motherboard will have the same memory problems that the 2990WX has on a quad-channel motherboard? Um, so when we first reviewed the 2990WX and performance was uh, terrible in anything that wasn't a rendering benchmark, uh, we put that down to memory issues because it's an epic CPU essentially that has eight channels, but it's only got four on the X399 chipset. But I think as we did some Linux-based testing and found out that in Linux uh, with better uh, OS support, uh, better support for more than what, like 16 cores, that the 2990WX performed really well. So it seems like most of the 2990WX's problems are down to the Windows scheduler. So uh, if they solve that, then you know the 2990WX become a much better CPU for those using Windows. And I don't think it's... Some workloads, sure, there's a bit of a memory bottleneck, but I don't think it's nearly as bad as what we thought originally. Uh, so I don't think the 16-core CPU will have any memory problems to answer your question. Yep. Hopefully memory latency and memory support, as in higher frequencies, uh, will also, you know... Uh, come to light with Zen 2, so that'll also uh, improve memory bandwidth anyway. So, yeah. Okay, I've got a question here from Ray AI. Hey, Steve, love your work. As a fellow Aussie, have you ever considered adding caveats for Aussies in your reviews? Just an example, uh, when the 9900K released, it came around uh, 849 AUD from PCK. We know that because we tried to buy yeah, one recently. It's right. 880 now. Anyway, um, sorry. While a smart buyer could pick up a 2700X from... Computer Alliance or MSY for about 380 Australian dollars, which I ended up doing because I don't pay almost triple for the same performance. Another example in Australia is the 1650 competing with the RX 580 rather than the 570 at that sort of 260 to $300 price. I think it would help inform the locals even if your viewer base is more US based. Yeah, well, the viewer base is certainly more US based by a factor of yeah, it's a huge, six huge or seven difference. times. So yeah. I'm not... Yeah, uh, the CPU pricing surprises me. Is the twenty was the twenty seven hundred X that cheap in Australia? Because it was four hundred and something dollars when we checked for our live stream. Yeah, three eighty. So I mean, yeah. Oh yeah, three eighty. I'm looking at. He's got the US and AUD around the wrong way, and I was looking yeah. at. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Uh, okay, so I'll move on with answering it. Basically, the margins, whenever I've looked at them, seem pretty similar between US and Australian pricing, which is why I usually focus on US pricing, because generally if I say a product's good value based on the US pricing, that brings true for here. Uh, and it certainly wouldn't have changed my conclusion for the 9900K. Um, yeah, that those margins were pretty much the same in the US. And it's the same what we just saw for our live stream build. We were tossing up between the 9900K and the 2700X. And basically we could get two 2700X processors for the same price as one 9900K, which is why we opted for the Ryzen processor. I mean, look, it'd be great if we could, you know, touch on Australian pricing in every video. The reason why we haven't made a habit of doing it is because often for products that we do day one reviews for, and that's really 
usually when I review a product, it's a day one review. I don't really review anything else, like my CPU and GPU reviews are usually day one. And at the time I don't get Australian pricing. I don't know what Australian pricing is. And even when we do get like a guide from the companies, it's always miles off. What they either, they, they're, It's either way above or way below. It just never seems to be accurate. Whereas the US MSRP is, and it gives us a good idea of what to expect in Australia. So that that's pretty much it. Yeah, yep. the fact that we don't get Australian pricing a lot of the time, and it's like four to five percent of our audience, the people that watch the videos will be Australian. So, yeah, I mean we're we're Aussies, we're based in Australia, but it's not an Australian tech channel, and I don't get the whole big drama with prices because as I said, the margins are similar. And you guys just have to jump over to any of the online retailers. It's like, not like you have to do some crazy amount of work to find out the price, like a six second Google search or look at PC case gear anywhere. It will tell you the price here. And yeah, it generally won't change our conclusion. So yeah, for all those reasons, we try, again, we, we do provide prices for Auss, you know, Aussie prices when we can. So when Tim does a monitor review, if it's sold in Australia and there's a price here, you'll give it. Yep. But otherwise, usually. if... It's a day one review and we don't have Aussie pricing. We don't know. So that's that. Okay, question here from Silent Gamer. How many gigabytes does the 36 game, or 36 games, I suppose, take on your hard drive? Well, we use SSDs because it's 2019. <laughs> um, they're using hard drives for secondary older games. Probably no big deal. Anyway, uh, I didn't know. So I went to work it out and I still don't know because I have way more than 36 games in current circulation. Um, I use 36 game benchmarks quite often, but that's for maybe testing GPUs, CPUs. I maybe have some different games. Anyway, uh, with all the games installed at the moment, the tally is just shy of three terabytes. It was 2.9 terabytes. Um, and that covers games from, you know, the Epic Games Store, a uh, Battle.net, Steam, Uplay, Origin, and one game from the dreaded Windows Store, and that's Forza Horizon 4. So, and you've got about two terabytes, don't you, of games? Yeah, yeah. Yep. yep. So, um, my entire collection, everything I own. Oh, I is, can't install everything yeah, I own. Like, <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's way too many games. Um, but yeah, in current circulation, three terabytes. And thank the Lord that Australia has finally got. Well, I've got MBN anyway, and not yeah. ADSL. So when I fire my test system up and have to download 60 gig worth of updates, I'm not out for the entire week. So yeah. that's kind of nice. So that, that's good. But anyway, okay, we've come a long way, Tim. But we, we are have. at the last question for the YouTube questions. And then we've Been got a, a whole lot, lot of whole yeah. lot of Patreon questions to get through now. So uh, our work is not done. But the last question is... Do you guys still have a range of X370 and B350 motherboards? And if so, do you plan on testing compatibility and VRM performance with the upcoming Ryzen 3000 CPUs? Okay, so first part of that question, yeah, we do have a lot of X370 and B350 motherboards. I've pretty much kept every single one I've ever been given, and we've only had one die, haven't we? Yeah, that's my one. Up there. Well, that the board still there. works. We've lost a DIMM slot on it. Yeah, a few DIMMs don't work. A few DIMMs don't work. Uh, but basically, I'm not expecting anything radical here like it's not like a 9900k situation on like your b360 boards where it's gonna absolutely fry the board without some serious limitations uh i would say and i'm not hail amd as we've been accused of in the past but i would say amd is more accurate with their tdp ratings than intel uh especially these days you i would agree? say so yep, yep. you tim's pretty clued in on the tdp thing because all, all his laptop testing but i would say as long as the TDP doesn't exceed 105 watts for any given part, then it should work perfectly fine on all B350, B450, X370, X470 motherboards because, well, basically, if the board supports the Ryzen 7 2700X, then any Zen 2 CPU with 105 watt TDP or lower should work without a problem. Yeah, and I think, you know, people see the supposed 16 cores as sort of, oh my God, they're, they're putting 16 cores in this thing that's going to, send your power consumption through the roof, but seven nanometers is providing such a significant, you know, mm -hmm. efficiency improvement as well that even if they do bring out a 16 core CPU, we don't know whether they will, but if they do, um, then it should be able to fit into sort of the standard TDPs that we've already seen, yep. at least with sort of reasonable clock speeds. Yeah. I mean, your eight core CPU is definitely going to come in to this. So any any of these boards should support the new higher clocked, higher IPC, eight core Zen 2 part. 
Yeah. So that's probably what people with B350 boards are concerned about. Um, but that's it. And that's it for part two of the April slash early May Q&A. Um, oh, what is there to say at this point? My voice is probably gone a little bit because I'm still a tiny little bit sick. What a trooper, this guy. But, uh, does, does a two-hour live stream build, a couple of hours on Q&A. And, well, yep. now you got to do the Patreon live stream. Yeah, that's the hard run box life. Okay. So we're always working. Um, yeah, just you know, subscribe, as always, if you like our videos. Give this video a like. There's probably going to be a part three, I think. So Yeah, I think a Patreon sort yeah, of part. Yeah, so definitely yeah. check back. We're not probably not going to have that in the next day, but you'll see that in the next week or so. And, yeah, I'm your host, Tim. I'm going to say it first this time. Well, I'm your host, Tim. I didn't see that coming. That I was know, incredible. Crazy. Uh, you've thrown me off. Who am right, I? I'll have to do it again. All right. <laughs> Re- ready? ready? Go, go. I'm your host, Tim. I'm your host, Steve. And I'll see you in the next one.